thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thank you to Inga and the organizers for being kind enough to uh, invite me here. I have a sense of deja vu because I was on the conference uh, that was mentioned in Reiner's comments, which was called After Bush. There was a sense of optimism uh, at the time that uh, Obama would bring a different kind of tenor and possibly a, a different kind of practice to um, American foreign policy and America's imperial role in the world. I was rather skeptical about that, although of course you could say that Obama brought something that was more acceptable um, to that position. Um, the, the, the current presidency sort of poses the question in a different way that Marx once posed. Um, the famous phrase, history repeats itself for the first time as tragedy. We were all disappointed that Obama didn't deliver more or differently. Uh, the second time as farce. And uh, I was watching um, the, uh, um, the world um, the World Economic Forum and I watched, watched um, the speech made by Donald Trump this afternoon and in discussion perhaps we can, we can, uh, we can reflect on that. Um, so Ingar asked me to try to answer a number of questions. Um, this is the panel that we speak to. Um, basically what shifts and transformations have taken place in the imperial global uh, constellation and I've grouped my talk under um, the following five headings, which correspond to the questions that Inga asked me to, to address. So first of all, some of the key structures of um, global capitalism. And I'll focus on one of the concepts that was mentioned by Reiner, the concept of market civilization and its uh, interface with the uh, concatenation of crises in the world uh, that um, generate a version of what Gramsci, writing about the 1930s, called a situation of organic crisis. And then the second set of questions Inga asked me to answer is, how are those structures being transformed? And again, I'll focus mainly on market civilization and the deepening and extension of neoliberalism on a world scale. All of these developments are rather contradictory, by the way, but I'll try and sketch what they are, and we can perhaps discuss many of the contradictions uh, in due course. Then, a slightly theoretical um, uh, introduction to concepts um, which I've developed on the structural and direct power of capital, and how that relates to the rise to power of a global plutocracy today, of which Trump is a particular representation. Um, and then the rivalries and tensions within the transatlantic ruling classes, they're not fully unified on world order strategies, and some of those um, um, differences have been coming out as a result of, um, uh, partly as a result of the Trump presidency. And then some reflections on security, um, the securitization efforts or potentials that may be built into a contradictory neoliberal world order in order to try to maintain the dominance of capital um, and under the, um, the leadership of plutocratic elements, uh, which, is, which corresponds partly to the global situation right now. So um, the first point is, is something that has been stressed by ecologists but it also has been stressed by political economists. And we could get into a lot of the details of this, but one of the things that's remarkable about the new world order that was created after World War II, despite the fact that it was configured by Cold War geopolitics, is that it precipitated what might be called the, a great acceleration in patterns of accumulation, um, patterns of consumption, patterns of distribution, so that a massive, massive acceleration in productive power, etc., uh, also coincided with transformations of the relationship between those patterns of development and human ecology. The other thing that was important about that kind of set of shifts, which are cumulative and structural, is that they're linked to what we call neoliberal globalization, and they've challenged national forms of um, governance and, and development. 
Now, one of the characteristics about this contradictory market civilization, to be understood as an oxymoron, since it's a kind of contradiction in terms, it's not particularly civilized according to many criteria, is that it's ecologically myopic. It involves the depletion of non-renewable resources, it's energy intensive, it involves the pollution and degradation of the environment, and what's increasingly recognized now is the, the pollution and degradation of the oceans. Now, of course, the system is driven by um, social forces in support of uh, that, that logic of development and civilizational pattern. And these have been called by um, leading banks such as um, uh, Goldman Sachs, the global middle classes, which are the object of many of these policies uh, and attempts to satisfy uh, their needs and their lifestyles. Of course, global capital seeks to um, make profits from those numbers. And of course, it doesn't include the, the population of the world. It's by definition a minority of the world. Um, but there is um, a set of forces that support it. So what is a, a condition of organic crisis? Well, when Gramsci was uh, reflecting on the 1930s, um, he saw the 1930s invo as involving a crisis of civilization as well as a crisis of capitalism. Um, he talked about the morbid symptoms of that period, and of course everybody in this room knows very well the extremist politics, the forms of violence, the racism and so on, that, that, that em emerged in that period and the tremendous battles to destroy forces of the left uh, in many countries. Um, Gramsci said that this organic crisis involved a crisis about the future, where there was a kind of a deadlock, where it was not clear what the future would hold. So uh, organic crisis is a situation that could last a long time, although given the great acceleration, one could say that today's organic crisis involves a kind of a telescoping of historical time because of the acceleration of the processes that are involved. So uh, to, to, to go beyond Gramsci, we have to talk about an organic crisis that is both ecological as well as social, as well as political, and of course, as Gramsci often emphasized, ethical and cultural. So how is this market civilization being extended? Um, the second of Ingar's questions. Well, it involves the deepening and penetration of the cultural, communicative, and accumulation forms of contemporary capitalism into our everyday lives. I suspect that many of the people that are in this room are Facebook subscribers. Um, and Facebook inv involves, if we want to get into the details of this, uh, the voluntary um, engagement of people who use their labor time, that is the time to post their identities online, and they sign contracts with Facebook, um, and their networks, their social networks, their so-called Facebook friends and their ideas, their proclivities, uh, their preferences and so on, become amenable to be made the cultural or the intellectual property of Facebook. And um, Facebook has an enormous proportion of the world's population, perhaps corresponding in many ways to the global middle classes, although not everybody that subscribes to Facebook necessarily subscribes to its aims or subscribes to the fact that their identities are being commodified. But this is a, is a very significant form of the deepening of market civilization because Facebook buys and sells this, uh, this commodified information to other firms, to advertisers, and so on, so they can promote more extended patterns of consumption. Oh, sorry. New modes of political communication and regimes of truth, which are partly contingent upon social media. We know very well that Donald Trump, with his incessant tweets, is very clever at, at this, but it's a, it's a double-edged uh, development because other social forces are also able to use these media, perhaps for more constructive or more progressive political purposes. Um, the recent development of, of politics in the Labour Party, for example, and the Momentum group, which has very successfully used social media, show that there are different ways to counter the official versions or the official regimes of truth. One thing that I would add, which is a concern of mine with respect to 
the regimes of truth is that there is an attack by many politicians, and not just from the right, on what might be called rational evaluation and the use of evidence to decide on particular policies. Trump, of course, is, is very clear about this, but there are a number of other developments within the prevailing modes of thought amongst the intellectual and other communities um, that call into question the validity of rationalism as a way of approaching um, political questions. Thirdly, um, this is very well known, the offshore world, tax evasion, capital finds havens to sequester its wealth throughout the world, escape regulation and escape effective taxation. That's part of the redistribution aspect, the radical redistribution within uh, market civilization um, and it, it involves um, a variety of phenomena um, and of course it has been linked to the funding of uh, conservative and neoliberal policies. Trump, Trump's supporters, for example, have subscribed uh, to, to these uh, techniques. Overall, market civilization has been characterized by enormous wealth transfers, particularly since 2008, from the poor to the rich. George Soros has, uh, has, has commented on this. He points out that quantitative easing, the way in which it provides easy money to large uh, holders of capital, large holders of wealth, is part of a set of mechanisms that are effectively transferring wealth from the poor to the rich. So overall, this involves on a much more world scale uh, what Marx called original accumulation. It's not just accumulation in, in general as it's structurally um, institutionalized, it is also the, the active and often violent dispossession of people of their livelihoods. Um, and one dimension of that is privatization. Again, we can get into discussions about that. So, just a couple of theoretical points here um, concerning the power of capital. What, one of the phenomena of the last uh, 20 or 30 years is that capital has escaped a series of regulatory and governance constraints. It's become much more institute, its, its preferences have become much more clearly institutionalized in governance practices and um, that has meant that the, 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 the governance standing um, of capital throughout much of the world uh, can benefit from those, um, th those institutions and practices in ways that are not available to labor or other organized um, forms of opposition. Um, and that's reinforced by growing capital mobility across jurisdictions itself linked to and is included, includes the, the offshore world. So that places capital with a kind of whip hand vis-a-vis -vis many jurisdictions. They can play jurisdictions across, uh, uh, one against the other to get concessions and to get um, what they want. That's a structural feature. The second feature is the direct power of capital, which is usually seen as something that's separate from government and it's lobbying of governments to get favorable laws and, 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 and regulations and so on, and business-friendly policies. But one of the phenomena that's very clear over um, uh, the last few decades is that capital is increasingly represented directly in key governments. The first major innovation were independent central banks, which of course are not independent. They're not independent in the sense that their, their governing boards reflect a cross-section of people, including progressive economists or radical or critical thinkers. The representatives on the, on the boards of independent central banks all come from the financial sector, Goldman Sachs and Co. Um, and they tend to operate in ways that put in place pre more precise measures that can benefit um, uh, capital, particularly financial capital. Um, Trump is actually very interesting and unusual in terms of the lineage of recent American presidents is because he has put a huge number of billionaires directly into key government positions. Um, and that's something that's a phenomenon throughout the world where we see presidents of countries or prime ministers of countries being billionaires, super wealthy plutocrats. Um, so the direct power of capital is actually more and more institutionalized in that sense um, in, in governing uh, arrangements. Now, um, moving on to the U.S. presidency and imperialism, by definition the U.S. presidency is an imperial presidency. Um, 
And although Trump is castigated for his embrace of uh, autocrat autocratic dictators, there's nothing really new in American support for dictators provided that they are deemed to be pro-American. It's a tradition, tradition of American pol foreign policy. Secondly, Trump is a little different from uh, perhaps Obama in that he is more supremacist in his stance towards the world. He wants to tell the world what to do. He doesn't want to negotiate. He doesn't want to share power. A hegemonic strategy be one, would be one that would take more account of the interests of opposition and to incorporate the interests of opposition, which to a certain extent is true of Obama. However, Trump is continuing to follow the, um, the, the lineage of his predecessors and pursues military policies which are premised upon American domination of the military world. The American doctrine calls this full spectrum dominance, which means the dominance of the American military against all theaters or dimensions of warfare, including cyber warfare. So Trump is simply continuing things there. Well, he is different. He's a neoliberal nationalist. Um, he opposes neoliberal establishment cosmopolitanism. He's not, he has no time for uh, humanitarian intervention. He has no time for making concessions. He has little time for multilateral negotiations if he can't see a direct benefit to his America First stance. So therefore, he goes against the grain of some important flanks of the American ruling classes in his perspective, and of course many of the European ruling classes uh, that would tend to ad adopt the uh, perspectives much more aligned with neoliberal cosmopolitanism. Of course, Trump, Trump, Trump is supremacist in that he's, he is a racist, and he espouses racism as a mechanism of divide and rule in the United States. Um, so Trump is a more pure neoliberal when it comes to economic policy and regulation. He wants to wipe away all public interest regulation if it gets in the way of, a, of, of the accumulation of capital. He wants to have business-friendly, liberal, neo, hyper-neoliberal regulation. And um, public interest regulation is really not something that he is concerned with. Um, he wants to make sure that, that na nation states regulate or pass laws on migration and on labor whilst maintaining um, the right for capital to freely move across jurisdictions. So, how is this securitized? Well, of course, as we all well know, the, the US is the, is the global policeman. It, um, it involves uh, the extended use of its surveillance and military power and intervention power. But the securitization of that world increasingly means that um, the U.S. has to avoid conflicts with other countries, which previously it could ignore. It cannot ignore China any longer. And of course, if there were to be a nuclear war with North Korea, it would effectively also be a nuclear war with China. Um, so uh, that security issue is a complex one now. Um, and of course, there are, t there are, there are deep tensions um, at all kinds of levels, but particularly within the ranks of the elites and ruling classes that, convene, that are convened at Davos, which is a kind of international of capital, over these issues, including trade and investment. They do not want to see uh, a trade war between the United States and China, because China provides most of the goods and services that satisfy all the consumer needs in market civilization. It's built, you know, its, its development is almost linked like an umbilical cord to the rest of the world. Um, and there are concerns about the internet. I know there have been issues raised about the regulation of big data in Europe um, and uh, how to deal with, with China, as I said. So they're worried about these things. They're also worried about the potential for a new global financial crash. Just before the previous financial crash, Alan Greenspan was talking about the global financial system being the most efficient that's ever been recorded in history, and it was resilient and was not prone to collapse. It was backed by an IMF report that called it st structurally resilient. Uh, well, we know what happened. Um, so there is what uh, Greenspan called irrational exuberance about this uh, at Davos, and some, but some people are wor worrying about a crash. And oddly enough, China has said, well, if there is a global financial crisis again, we will really be at the forefront to bailing it out. So that's a kind of paradox where the Communist Party of China comes to the rescue of global capitalism. <laughs> 
So finally, these are just some thoughts about securitization which you might want to just ponder. I've gone a bit over my time, so I'll try and go through these things. Now let's say that conditions change. What are the global plutocracy doing to try to securitize their wealth and their holdings against all of us and much of the rest of the world? Well, they have been build, busily building luxury underground bunkers from previously used nuclear fallout uh, um, 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 installations with um, you know, like gigantic <laughs> underground hotels. Um, and of course, they're supposed to be um, impermeable to nuclear weapons and, and the, the masses. Uh, also enclaves, uh, Peter Thiel, who is a, a supporter of Trump, has, has, built a, has, has purchased a, a gigantic estate in New Zealand, as well as purchasing New Zealand citizenship so he can live there in peace. Um, extension of gated capitalism, this is something that Ingar uh, calls gated capitalism. Um, I could talk about this in detail, but there is a very interesting innovation here um, by Google, which is seeking to construct new wealthy enclaves of, 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 of enormous housing developments and neighborhoods uh, using its capital and its surveillance and panoptic capacities. And finally, something that they're debating at Davos is how to secure their holdings uh, in a form that can't be expropriated. Let's say there were a revolution or there was a government that decided to nationalize the holdings of people that had wealth of over a hundred million dollars. Um, they're exploring these things through what are called secure, decentralized transactional platforms. And a couple of them, that, well, the, the couple of them that they were debating at Davos are called blockchain and um, also cryptocurrencies like, um, um, and I call this a Swiss option because Switzerland and a couple of other f offshore financial centers have offered themselves to facilitate this development. Okay, that's it, thank you.